All right, so here we go with the last of the videos for this chapter. We've talked about turns, current currents quite a bit, and now we're going to talk a little bit about deep currents. Deep currents are kind of a big deal. Um, they occur below the picnic line is sort of the definition of them, even though they're highly influenced by surface waters. Um, and the, one of the reasons why we care about them is that they are, 90% of the ocean are um, influenced by deep water currents. So how do they occur? Well, where do they occur, I guess, is first. They mostly occur in the subpolar um, at the North Atlantic and um, all around Antarctica. We're going to talk uh, farther on about why they don't occur in the North Pacific. What happens is you have um, higher density water that forms at the surface and it sinks or downwells, and this starts the water on the bottom moving. It doesn't move very fast. Um, on the order of like two to three Svedrups is the fastest deep ocean currents. Meanwhile, the, the Antarctic Circumpolar is ripping around at like 100. Um, in terms of miles per year, these currents, like their speed is very slow as well as their volume transport. Six to 12 miles per year, which are very, very slow. They're called um, thermohaline circulation as well as deep currents. Thermo because temperature is the most important factor in terms of deter uh, determining what... Um, where and how fast and all of that that the deep ocean currents move. The next important factor is salinity. So what are the deep oceans like? They're cold, um, relatively still, not a lot of water moving. Um, they're dark. There's very little productivity. All of it that there is is, um, you know, going to be sparse, spread out, hydrothermal vents, stuff like that. And most of the organisms that live there have to deal with very high pressure. This picture is in the book. I can't remember the figure number. I think it's like figure number 20. Um, this one I, you should take a look at. Um, this is called a temperature salinity diagram. And, and in the boxes are the characteristics of those particular water masses. So temperature has the greatest effect. Um, colder water is just more dense. And the ranges of temperatures we see in the ocean mean that temperature is going to have a bigger effect. Salinity does have an effect, but salinity doesn't vary that much. It Maybe it's as low as 33 and as high as 37. Um, if we had a bigger range of possible salinities, it would become a bigger player in the, in the thermohaline circulation. But when you get to the high latitudes where you have the downwelling, salinity becomes very important. Um, at high latitudes, the water's cold uh, all over the place. But when you have ice freezing, um, you get what's called a brine expulsion or um, brine reduced salt. And when salt freezes, uh, excuse me, when ice freezes, the salt is expelled um, from the ice, so the ice floats, leaving the salt, the water that's left behind, the liquid water, not only um, the, the same temperature, still cold, but now it's also much saltier that saltier, colder water then sinks below the slightly fresher water below it. And that's where we get downwelling in the beginning of some of the deep water currents. Um, you should probably know from this diagram, um, I'll circle the ones that are a big deal. Um, the, of course, we have Antarctic bottom water. Um, and actually, maybe let me take a step back. Along the bottom, down here, we have salinity, where it increases going to the right of the x-axis. And we have temperature going up. So things that are um, towards the left tend to be saltier and uh, fresher, and things that are to the right are saltier. Things that are farther up are warmer, and things that are farther down are colder. Okay, so fairly basic. Antarctic bottom water is AABW. Um, you need to know that one. Antarctic intermediate water and North Atlantic deep water are the big players. Um, these two, um, I'll mention them in passing, but they're not quite as important. We're going to talk about those sources of water in greater detail now, and I'll probably be flipping back and forth between the pictures, so hopefully it doesn't get stuck. AABW is Antarctic bottom water. Um, hopefully you know where the abbreviation comes from. It's the coldest, densest water on the planet. It moves very slowly. It takes about a 1,000 years to get back to the surface once it downwells. Um, it's deepest. It's found at, on average, greater than 4 kilometers down. And when we're talking about salinity, it has sort of average salinity for deep water. It's around 34.5 up to 34.7 PPT. It is very, very cold, though. Um, and I guess for all of these, you should make note of the temperature and the um, salinity and sort of um, be able to tell me which one's coldest, which one's warmest, um, which one's high salinity, which one's low, which one's medium. 
and this is all relative to each other. So Antarctic bottom water is the coldest. Um, zero, it can actually get negative zero, and because of the pressure, the ice can't freeze. It can be like uh, negative one degree, up to about one degree Celsius. Because it's cold, it has a lot of oxygen, and it has sort of medium salinity. The North Atlantic deep water is a little bit warmer, 2 to 4 degrees Celsius. It's just not cold enough in Norway compared to Antarctica for it to be much colder. But what it is, is a lot saltier. There's a lot more freezing of ocean water in the North Atlantic um, near Norway. Remember, Antarctica is a continent, so what, where we get freezing is just around the edges of the continent. The North Atlantic meets up with the Arctic Ocean, and the Arctic Ocean is just an ocean. So when you get freezing there, uh, the brine gets pushed out of the salt at a uh, much higher rate than it does around Antarctica. So even though it only seems like it's just like a per, tiny part of a part per thousand, that is becomes really important when we compare it to Antarctic intermediate water. Now, one of the how do we identify these? Well, we look them up. We look up their characteristics of a of a mass of water and compare it to this diagram. And let me go back. On this diagram, if we say we got a sample of water that was around, you know, 35 um, PSU, and we would look on this diagram and kind of find the 35 PSU, then we would look at its temperature and say its temperature is only about 4 degrees. Um, and then where they meet, if it's in that box, it's that mass of water. We then would confirm it with depth. There's a couple other ways to tell. With North Atlantic deep water, it actually has CFCs. Um, I hope you remember that CFCs are chlorofluorocarbons. Chlorofluorocarbons come from people spraying aerosols in the air. Um, they've been banned for about 10 years. But the North Atlantic deep water is old enough that it has them. And the very old waters like the Antarctic bottom water and the Antarctic intermediate don't have CFCs. CFCs indicated as a fairly young mass of water, which is what the North Atlantic deep water is, and that it's inter interacted with the um, atmosphere in a fairly urbanized one at that um, fairly recently. So you can actually find CFCs, and that's one of the ways they identify North Atlantic deep water. The Antarctic intermediate water is slightly, and I do mean slightly water, there's some over lap here is slightly warmer than the North Atlantic deep water, um, about three to seven degrees Celsius. But what it is, is it's actually fresher. It's almost a full PPT fresher. What this means is that on here, um, if we were to label these, this is the, the deepest, and then this, and this is more middle, and this is like medium deep. Um, and with surface waters above the picnic line. So the deepest is Antarctic bottom, then in the Atlantic, you would find um, at the right above that North Atlantic deep water, and then in the me middle area, Antarctic intermediate water. What's interesting is Antarctic intermediate water is very persistent. Um, it forms in the Antarctic and it moves sort of northward very slowly. And if you go to 60 degrees north of the um, equator, that's like, you know, North Atlantic, you can still find traces of the Antarctic uh, intermediate water. There are many, many other masses of water. Um, the MIW is the Mediterranean Inter Intermediate. It's on that diagram from the page before. The Med Intermediate water is unique to the Atlantic Ocean. You will not find it in the Pacific. Um, it's very, very, very salty, um, upwards of 40 ppt. So it wants to sink, but it's also very, very, very warm, so it wants to float. And the uh, Mediterranean Intermediate water will actually form a pocket within uh, the Antarctic Intermediate water, and it's kind of unique that way. Um, the other ones, like AIW, is Arctic Intermediate Water, forms um, in specific areas. doesn't get much past the Arctic, but it exists there. Um, then you have um, sub-Antarctic uh, mode water. These things are found in specific areas and not as widespread. The reason why we talk about these three major ones is they're found and influence all the ocean basins. And I'll explain how the North Atlantic does that right now. So this would be a cross-section of the Atlantic, and that should probably say this, um, Atlantic, and um, you have the North Atlantic deep water, which has come all the way from the Norwegian area, and has now made it to the continental shelf of Antarctica. This water um, interacts with the Antarctic bottom water. Now, the Antarctic bottom water is colder. Um, this is slightly saltier, but this Antarctic bottom water is enough colder that it goes under it. This pushes the North Atlantic deep water up. This is a very wide mass of water, and it does different things in different parts. At the area near the Antarctic bottom water, notice we have it mixing back down. Um, as I'm sure you remember from the 
section before, this area right here is the area of Antarctic divergence. Um, there's a bunch of mixing. Um, the currents move past each other, uh, and and we have some upwelling, which sucks up some of the deep water. But along this boundary between the two, we have mixing. So the Antar North Atlantic deep water mixes with the Antarctic bottom water in this area. This becomes important um, when we talk about other ocean basins. Meanwhile, a little bit of it also mis mixes with the Antarctic intermediate water along this boundary. So they, they, we call them water masses. There is some mixing at the areas. And notice this is the Antarctic convergence in this same area. These are natural boundaries in the ocean. They're sort of unique in the Southern Ocean. Yep. Hold on one sec. This is a more general um, cross-section from the north to the south. And you can see that almost everywhere... Um, you can do a cross section. If you were to say drop a, um, like the YSI and you had a really long cord on it, you could drop it almost anywhere and you would hit a water mass that's cold and salty, one that's cold, but, um, not as cold. And you would be able to get these different layers of water as you move down almost anywhere in the Atlantic. Um, and this cross section is probably important to know and to be able to draw, at least these, be able to label if I gave you. Um, if I gave you these outlines, I would expect you to be able to label this like NADW, ABW, and maybe put the arrows in of which way they flow. This picture, um, is, there's no picture of this in the book, so I, I put this one. This is from a scientific paper, and it's way more complicated. You will not be expected to draw this. Um, but the Pacific and the Indian Oceans are very different in terms of their layers than the um, Atlantic. First of all, there's no North Atlantic deep water. Um, remember, the North. if we're looking at the, the southern hemisphere here, in the Atlantic, the North Atlantic deep water would be going... Oh, go backwards. North Atlantic deep water would be flowing this way. It's not happening. Um, what we have instead is Antarctic bottom water forming along the continent um, in this area just like we would expect. So you still have Antarctic bottom water. Up here we have Antarctic intermediate water, same as before. Instead, in the middle, we ha now have what they call circumpolar deep water, or older books call it uh, oceanic common water. This water still has some North Atlantic deep water. Remember, these currents flow all the way, the surface currents, all the way around. And if you look right in here, you can see those surface currents flowing. Remember the North Atlantic deep water mixed in with the Antarctic bottom water and the Antarctic intermediate? Um, these surface currents, and, and some of the North Atlantic even upwelled, the, these surface currents pick up some of that North Atlantic deep water and mix, see how this arrow is double-sided, and mixes it back down in the circumpolar deep water. That CDW water does have some characteristics of the North Atlantic deep, um, but it, it generally moves in the opposite direction. There's less upwelling, and... Um, it just doesn't have as big a difference in terms of salinity and temperature. Um, so it's a less distinct water mass. And and the North Atlantic deep water is a very specific water mass. So they, they are not the same, even though they sort of occur in the same depth range. Um, back in chem, I told you about the global conveyor belt. There's a picture in the book. This was a model developed by Henry Steimel, and he's sort of famous oceanographer. And it basically shows the connection of all of the areas of downwelling with all of the major areas of upwelling. And um, this is a really important idea. The, this is what controls climate. This global conveyor belt um, via surface currents moves heat from the um, tropical areas to the poles. That, that heat is given off to the atmosphere. That cold water then sinks, moves back along the bottom and upwells again, absorbs more heat and moves it around. Um, so it controls climate. There are concerns like that super awesome movie we watched watch the day after tomorrow about um, if there's a lot of flooding of fresh water from melting sea ice into the North Atlantic, that the North Atlantic deep water will stop moving. And there are concerns that this would um, then influence the Gulf Stream and basically send uh, the North Atlantic region back into an ice age. And this has happened before. Uh, it happened in Europe about 200 years ago, and they called it the mini ice age. This is the global conveyor belt picture in the book. I hate this picture. Um, it's badly drawn. 
they, in order to show where the, um, and I'm going to kind of circle where it's really bad. Look, who knew that in that area, there is a, um, moving towards the north, there's a boundary current, but it's on the wrong side. Um, so what I want you to take away from this is don't use this picture that's in the book. It's too stylized, and to show you what's underneath, they kind of move things around, which is not accurate. This picture is much better. Um, if you notice, the the boundary currents are still where they're supposed to be. Um, warm ones tend to be on the eastern side of basins, and um, I'm sorry, on the western side of basins, and cooler ones tend to be on the other side. This is a little stylized as well, not quite as um, good, but you should pick up that there's some areas of deep water formation. Deep water forms in the North Atlantic in two areas, right around Greenland, both of them. Deep water forms in several areas, and if we looked over here, there'd be some forming there. Um, and that that deep water formation is really important. Only a few areas of upwelling. Um, almost all of the upwelling happens in the Pacific, and a little bit right here. One thing that's drastically absent from this is a um, presence of deep water formation in the Pacific. There's none there. And this is because of the Pacific, uh, especially around Korea, Japan, um, there's a lot of fresh water um, from Akatsk River and the Bay the area. So there's just not enough, that fresh water just is too salty, um, too fresh, and won't let the salty water form when the ice does. Uh, so that's kind of it for this chapter. We are done. And I will post that right now.